Hours of Christ Fellowship with Dr. Stephen Gray. Hallelujah. God bless you. Um, I want to share something with you before I get into this message, because I don't want to have to remember to say it later. But I want to talk to you a little bit about the glory of God. And I remember when I was in Africa and all the glory was fallen and we were just engulfed. And I came, started traveling all over the world, different places, and God brought me to Florence, Alabama. And I don't remember if someone gave me a word, but um, I had written a bunch of emails and a book that was on my computer. And when I got to Florence, Alabama, the Lord said, publish the book. So I said, Lord, and so I went to reread it to see where it was and how much more and the editing it needed. And as I'm reading through this book, now this was 10 years ago, so that I'll tell you, this was right around 2010, I guess, somewhere in there, 20, 2011. And uh, I'm reading this book and I'm, I'm reliving a lot of this that I'd, all, I'd really forgotten and I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, why are you having me? Why did you do this? Why did you bring the glory on my life like this? Because I had looked and read and tried to find very few people had lived in the glory like I had. And uh, there was Ruth Heflin and a few others, but not very many people. Some, many people had accessed it, but not many people were carrying it. It wasn't on them. And I said, Lord, why did you do that? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, I, I put the glory on your life to bring an intimacy into you so I could teach you how I want disciples made. And that kind of shocked me. But you know, John 17, 22 says, Jesus is praying, he says, I've given them my glory that they may be one as we are one. And so oneness and the glory is, that's how you carry it. Now you can access it if you focus and worship on God. But to carry the glory, you have to be one with God. Well, you ain't one with God if, you don't, if you're not making disciples, because that's what he's, his purpose and will is. So I was just thinking about that this morning. I was getting ready to share this message today, which is called the relaunch. And I'm telling you right now, and I'm declaring it here today, and to those of you that are listening to it on video, God is getting ready to relaunch the church. Now, when I came here, uh, 2010 or so, God spoke to me and He said, the church of today is not of my design. And at first, I thought he was rebuking me for planting churches in Africa. And then I realized he was trying to show me something that I've been spending the last 20 years trying to figure out, or last 10 years, 12 years, to figure out what he meant by the church of today is not of my design. I remember... Well, I was actually down in Florida and I had gone into a, a situation where I was ministering the glory and uh, God spoke to me when I was leaving that place and he said, I'm not sending you into churches anymore. And I thought, wow, I've done something wrong. And he said, no, I'm pulling you out. He says, I'm going to send you to a place to make a create a place for my glory to reside. And I said, oh, okay. So I, I came home and that was before I ended up in Florence, Alabama. Um, why Florence, Alabama, you might ask? Because I asked that question. And the first thing God said was, because Florence, Alabama is a gate. It's, it's the northern gate to Alabama. So I said, okay, I, I knew about gates because I'd found gates in Africa when we were reaching that country, Tanzania and Kenya. And a lot of the gates were along the coast. And you found a gate 
through geographical areas like ports and rivers, also where there were people coming in uh, historically into areas would create gates. And um, so, and I also found that wherever there was a gate, usually the enemy, the devil, had done something to try to create an atrocity or a problem to close that spiritual gate. And so God says, I've sent you into Florence, Alabama because it's a gate. So I'm like, okay, I know about gates. So then I said, well, Lord, but why Florence? Why Alabama? And God says, because I'm getting ready to pour something out in Alabama that's never been done before. And I said, why Alabama? You may be, if you're listening to this message, you're saying, why Alabama? Because Alabama was the first state in the nation that approved Israel as a nation in 1948. Alabama was the first state. That kind of blew my mind. Because it's almost like God says, I've got to pour out first to, because I'm going to bless Alabama because for that reason. And so I was like, wow. So he said this. And if you're listening to this message, you heard it here first. It's going to start in Florence. It's going to move into Alabama. Then it's going to go to the nations. Then it'll go to the world. That's what he told me. So God has collected a, a small group of people and, and put them through hell, if I could be honest about it, over the last 10 years to get you ready for what's coming. Because He doesn't want you to just be in the glory. He wants you to carry the glory to the nations. And in order to do that, you've got to know how to make disciples, which is why this church exists and what we're doing here. Hallelujah. Praise God. So I say to you, the church of today, and if you'll just let down all your religious uh, beliefs for a minute and just listen to what I'm going to say. The church of today is not of my design. What does that mean? Well, one of the things I've noticed is that religious leaders all over, anybody with any kind of a prophetic gift knows something's wrong, something's off. And they're prophesying about change and all these things that are coming. We're in the end times. <clears throat> Let me just get to the nuts and bolts of this. The elders, the leaders of the church, are not taking care of God's sheep. And I can tell you from taking, for, for 15 years, taking teams to Africa, because that's what I did. I would take teams over. I can tell you that the leaders that were going to Africa were not prepared for mission work. They were not, their strongholds weren't torn down. They weren't mature enough. And God basically told me to stop bringing them at one point because it was dangerous. Because we weren't just doing building projects. We were literally trying to push back the darkness in East Africa. And so here's the, here's the key. Romans chapter 8. I'm going to read you several verses today. Romans chapter 8, verse 13 and 14. I want to read these to you. It says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as, this is verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Why? Most Western Christians can't go to Africa and do any work. It's the same reason they can't do any work here is because they cannot be consistently led by the Holy Spirit. That's your fault, Mr. Elder, Mr. Leader. The reason why they can't be led by the Spirit is because they've never been discipled. They've never had their strongholds torn down. Never been told how to hear and access God. So as a result, they can't consistently be led by the Spirit. Look, Everybody who's born again hears the Spirit of God from time to time. But we're talking, you've got to be able to hear God consistently if you want to be led by the Spirit. Now, God wants you to know that He loves you. He died for you. I love the song we sang earlier, man, we're chosen. You know... But most leaders are concerned with what people are doing, 
not who they are. You rarely hear people speak about identity from the pulpit. The problem is you're not going to correct people's behavior by preaching against it. You correct people's behavior by telling them their identity, who they are in Christ. Because Proverbs, I think it's 23, 7 says, As we believe in our hearts, so are we. Or so as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so you see, that's why we're acting and doing the things we're doing. That's why Paul says in Romans 7, 19, What I want to do, I can't do. What I don't want to do, I keep on doing. In chapter 8, he gives a solution to overcoming this sin nature. And that is you have to set your mind on what the Spirit desires. So that's why the breastplate, and Paul's teaching in Ephesians, he says the breastplate is, a, uh, is righteousness. Righteousness is our breastplate. That's your identity. And see, how many Christians, if you don't know your righteousness, you don't believe you're righteous, God's made you righteous, He imputed it to you, then you are, you are susceptible to every attack of the enemy. Hallelujah. <clears throat> God's grace and His power <clears throat> is real today. Just like it was when He walked on the earth. It's no more real back then than it is now. The problem is we don't know how to access it. Because we don't know how to be in the Spirit consistently. Hallelujah. And part of the problem, I'm sorry to say, is leaders are trying to tell everybody what to do. And that's a hindrance. <clears throat> so, when God was showing me all this, and He was talking about the importance of discipleship, He took me to this passage, and I began to question Him and say, Lord, can you show me in Scripture where this is? And so He took me to 1 Peter chapter 5. Listen to what it says. The elders, he, so Peter's talking to the elders, who are among you, I exhort. I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. And look at verse 3. This is the key. Nor is being lords over those entrusted to you. Nor is being lords over those entrusted to you. But being examples to the flock. Examples. Don't control people. Don't tell people what to do. Be an example. Teach with your own life. Hallelujah. Now, this word in here, uh, Lord, Lord over, comes from the Greek word uh, katurio, if I'm saying that correctly, and I may not be. Uh, but what it means, and, 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 and think about this, why would Peter be exhorting or correcting the elders? Think about it. Because it was a problem, even in those days. To lord against, that is to control or subjugate, to exercise dominion over someone when that is the only place where Jesus Christ is to be. To rule, to govern, to reign over people. That is never man's place. That's not the pastor's place. That's not an elder's place. Why? Because you're supposed to be leading by example, which means you're led by the Spirit and you're not telling people what to do. You're, you're encouraging them and you're teaching them to connect to God and listen to God. So this is, one of, this is why the church is not of God's design. is because we've totally lost that concept. The reason why is we lost the, the mission in meetings. The mission is a kingdom message. Now listen to this verse. This is in Matthew chapter 20. Just carrying this same theme forward. Jesus says, But Jesus called them to Himself and said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles. 
Okay, lord it over them. There it is again. And their great men exercise authority over them. Talking about the unbelievers. It is not this way among you. This is Matthew 20, 25 through 28. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. <laughs> that's, that's addressed to leaders. People that are governing or, or ruling over people. Listen to what it said. This is Matthew 23. A few chapters down. Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Now, in those days, the chair of Moses in the tabernacle or the temple was the seat where you would sit when you would read the Torah. And it was, to, it was to instruct the people. It says, Therefore, all that tell you do and keep, but do not do according to their deeds. And you see, I, I see this so rampant today. We have no authority over one another. That's why we lead by example. That's why we answer why questions. That's why we don't speak into people's life. We don't control people. And we use the Word of God as it talks about being sitting in the chair of Moses. We use the Word of God, but we have to be so careful because what Jesus continuously rebuked the Pharisees and the Sadducees for is they were taking the Word of God and they were twisting it to get what they wanted out of it, to make people do what they wanted. That's why he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Because they, they were preaching the word, the Torah, but they were trying to beat people over the head to control them, to make them do what they wanted. Jesus is saying that so far as the teaching of the law of the Moses, the Jewish people were required to listen to them, but their interpretation was wrong. They were using it. That's why he said, beware of them. Don't do what they're saying. Do it, do, don't listen to what they're saying. Do the principles of the Word, but don't act as they're acting. This is what's wrong with the church today. We've all become, so many of the leaders have become pharisaical leaders. Romans 8, 14 is to be considered as part of the context of the whole Word. And, and this is the bottom line then we are to be led by the Holy Spirit and not man. As many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. We should be encouraging people to be led by the Spirit, not by man. Listen to this. This is Matthew 23. This is a few verses down. This is in verse 8 through 12. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth your father. For one is your father who is in heaven. Listen what this is saying, y'all. He's speaking to leaders. Do not call instructors. For one is your instructor, and that is Christ. I'm reading from the Scriptures, y'all. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. The leaders, the apostles, the prophets should be serving the church, not telling everybody what to do, not trying to run the show. And whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. And whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. That's Matthew chapter 23, verses 8 through 12. Woe to the religious leaders of today. They're modern day Pharisees. Every one of them, or most of them. So God spoke to me this week, and I shuddered when He spoke, and here's what He said, I'm getting ready to relaunch the church. Whoa. That's what He said. God is going to send out laborers once again to reach the lost and the backslidden. So He spoke to me, and He says, the message that's coming forth is the kingdom message which we've lost. We lost that message because we got all caught up in church business. That's why the churches are so out, 
off track. Here's your, here's your marching orders. This is Mark chapter 16, verse 17. And believe it or not, I had someone call me the week I'm preparing this message, which was two weeks ago. I had somebody call me telling me their pastor told them we could not cast demons out of people. We had no authority. I was like, and you're still there? That ain't Jesus telling him that. That's something else. Now listen what this says. Mark chapter 16, verse 17. And these signs will follow those who believe. Not the most anointed, not the leaders. Those who believe. In my name, they'll cast out demons. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up servants. If they drink anything deadly, it'll by no means hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. This is the believers, the true believers, the true, the called out ones, which is really what all church means. The word's not used very much in scripture. It just means those called out. Called out of what? Called out of society. And they're sent on a mission. Hallelujah. And that's our marching orders. It was never about an organized church structure. That's not coming yet. It's about a mission to go into all the world and make disciples. You are the church, but you lost the message. People need healing because they're oppressed today. And I declare to you today and on this video the kingdom of heaven is at hand once again. Hallelujah. Teaching people how to grow spiritually, how to overcome the flesh, and deal with life's issues, which is primarily our sin nature, which you've got to learn to overcome. Hebrews 5.12, Paul rebuked immaturity in the church, in the Hebrew church, in the Hebrews, wherever they were, what churches they were. James 1, 7 says this, you shall receive nothing from God without faith. So don't you think that's important that God's going to be building up people's faith? You can't build people's faith. God has to do that. The kingdom of heaven is about the king and his will, which is what any kingdom is about, is, is carrying the king's will forward. That's why it's called a kingdom. Now, if you can't hear and be led, you're not in the kingdom. So just by the facts, that's why the church of today is not in the kingdom of God. That's why God's relaunching it. So God said, you need to go back, and he sent me back to Luke chapter 10. Verse 1. And he started speaking to me about how he's getting ready. Now, I don't know exactly when this is going to happen, but it's coming soon, within the next few weeks, I believe. We're going to see something different that's going to happen. And I'm telling you this now to get you ready. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. It says, After these things, the Lord appointed 70... Others also. So this is not just the, the apostles. This is 70 other believers. So it was all the believers probably they had around them. And he sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. He sent them out. And he said then, he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray. The Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So that's what we need to be doing right now. We need to be praying for these laborers that are going to go out. I don't know if there's more than just these few here or there's some on the video. I don't know where they are. I'm sure God's got a bunch of people reserved for this. But I'm telling you something's getting ready to happen in your life and God's going to send you out. Okay. So he says here, when he says this, he says, pray, therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Okay, now so take this apart. I want you to see what he's saying. He says, verse 3, go your way, 
Behold, I send you out as lambs among the wolves. Okay, so he knows what we're up against. And he knows you're going to see a lot of people that are going to rebuke you and not receive anything you're going to say. But let me tell you something. When you go, when he sends you, you're going to have power. Verse 4, carry neither money, bags, knapsack, nor sandals. So in other words, don't go out there with a bookcase. Don't go out there with all kinds of supplies. Just go. The, the emphasis here is on a going in obedience. He says, and greet no one along the road. So let me just tell you, don't go down. Says, if he says go to the park, don't talk to everybody you see in the park. Don't get on the soapbox, start preaching to everybody in the park unless he tells you to do that. He's saying, don't talk. Why is he telling you don't talk to people on the way? Because he's sending you to somebody directly. You, you, well, I don't know if I hear you. are going to hear, trust me. Something's getting ready to happen. It's going to bring you into a realm and a level you don't even know about. And you're going to hear God like you've never heard God before. He's getting ready to relaunch the church. You better get ready. You're going to know who to go talk to and you're going to know what's going on. So greet no one along the road. This is verse 5. But whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. Now that's what Scripture says. That word peace is not shalom because that's Hebrew and this is Greek. The, the, the Greek word is irene. It starts with an E, but it's, it's pronounced Irene. And it's, listen what this means. A set of favorable circumstances involving peace and tranquility. Peace and tranquility. Do you know that most people he's going to send you to that are looking for the kingdom have got no peace in their life. That's why he's sending you. So when you say peace to you, sir, ma'am, peace to this house, something is going to happen. They're going to feel something. Something's going to happen. If you, if you knew in this day that those things related to peace, like it says in Luke 19, 42, send him on his way in peace, 1 Corinthians 16, 11. The meaning of peace or tranquility may be expressed in some languages in a negative form. For example... To be without trouble or to have no worries or to sit down in one's heart. So this, this word peace is way more powerful than we realize. According Now listen to this. According to Old Testament prophets, shalom in the Hebrew, irene in the Greek, will be an essential characteristic of the Messiah's kingdom. And therefore used almost synonymously with the idea of salvation through Christ. When you get reconciled to God, if you're speaking to a lost person or even someone's backslid, and you say, peace be upon you, there's going to be something that's going to happen in the spirit that's going to reconnect that person's spirit back to God. In fact, this word describes both the content and and the goal of the New Testament Christian message called the gospel of peace. In Ephesians 6.15. So see, when you speak peace to this house, and it says, if, if they don't receive it, then shake the dust off your feet and go to the next person. Don't argue. We're not trying to convince people. We're looking for the ones God's sending us to. Hallelujah. God will direct you what to say. Say, the kingdom of heaven has come to you today. Let them ask questions. I would check, are you born again? What does that mean? That's the first thing to ask people because I think most Christians today are not born again. They've got too much control. And they've been controlled. God's going to direct you. If He sent you to this person, He's going to tell you what to say. Don't tell them to come to church. 
Tell them to come to Jesus. You can't come to church. We don't even have the right mindset. It's a kingdom. You call people to church, you're calling people to man. Call them to the kingdom of God. Does that make any sense to anybody? Well, do we ask them to church? I said, if they want to come to church, let them come. But we're coming to rejoice for what we do outside in the kingdom, on the mission. Hallelujah. Their needs are important, so listen and pray for them. Mark 16, 17. And say, look, this just wrong. Say, look, you know, sometimes you get, you, you speak this kind of stuff and people get overwhelmed and start crying. And you say, look, let's make an appointment. I'll come back and we'll talk more. Hallelujah. That's what it's all about. When you follow up on somebody and say, I'll come back. When, when's a good time? Set up another appointment. Then it shows you really care. You're not just knocking on doors or whatever the situation now listen to me. This is what the Lord told me. He says, when you go, when He sends you, you're going to be walking in the power of God like you've never known before. So you're going to pray for the sick. You're going to cast out demons. And they're going to get healed. <laughs> they're going to get healed. Now, trust me. When you start healing people, when you start praying for people and they start getting healed, you're going to have their attention. I've seen it in Africa. I've stood before crowds of people trying to tell them about Jesus and they were laughing until somebody stepped in front of me and said, I need healing and I pray for them. They get healed and all of a sudden... Everybody shuts up. Everybody Now everybody's listening. So see, but see, you ain't going to bring people to church because you're bringing them to man. You got to bring people to Jesus. This is about connecting people to Jesus. He's the king of kings. Do you, can, can they come later to church? Sure, they can come and worship and celebrate what God is doing in their life. But we're not calling them to church. We're calling them to follow Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We lost the mission in a meeting. That's actually a quote from an old missionary that some of you heard. Pray for them. Invite them to learn who He is and how to follow Him. The song we sang earlier, I'm Chosen. I mean, that was an incredible song. It's like I've never heard that song before. Uh, Katie says we've played it before, but I, I don't remember it. <laughs> it was like, wow. Do we know who we are? You, you better. Because when you hear God get up, go, go, you know. You, so some of you are holding signs up. That's just, a, that's kindergarten. Get ready. You're getting ready to get the real marching orders. <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen, demonstrate. What, what did it feel, uh, 1 Peter 5? Demonstrate. What do we say? Everybody said, what do we say? You, don't, you just say what God tells you to say. You be led by the Spirit. Show them what it looks like to be a follower. God's been getting y'all ready for this. So we had testimonies this morning about all the stuff y'all have been going through. Do you think that God's just beating you up because He likes to beat people up? He's been pressing you in all these areas just because He likes to be mean? He's getting you ready for something. Answer their why questions. They should have a lot of them. But speak to them only what God tells you. Most people are not used to this. I mean, they're they're going to be astounded. I'm going to speak to you more on authority later. We're going to talk tonight. We're going to talk more about this. A couple weeks ago, I preached a message. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ 
who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. We've gotten our following Jesus distracted by church stuff. And, and when we've done, gotten off track, man has controlled us. That's not the plan. Hallelujah. To un, when we understand that human flourishing is a function of God's redemptive work in the world, the very core of His relation toward His creatures God paints a beautiful picture of biblical flourishing represented by the words shalom and irene when you say peace. You can take everything I have, just don't take my peace. And you only find that kind of peace one way when you're in God's will. So when God says, I want you to go to talk to so and so, and when you walk in their house and says, I say, peace be to you. Something's going to happen in their life. It shows us that God's goal in redemption through Christ is the restoration of what was lost in the fall. Peace. We lost the mission of the kingdom in church meetings. And now God is going to restore it. Remember the charge in Luke 10, 5. First say, Peace. If peace comes on them, they receive. Then if, if not, then leave. If it stays on them, then stay and, and disciple them. That just sounds almost foreign when I say it. Because we're just not used to it. Now, if you've been a missionary and you've gone to some foreign land, then you're used to this. That's what God keeps saying. That's why the glory's not in the church. It's because the glory's going to be on the mission when you're following Jesus and going into all the world.